Hello everybody and welcome to Play UK and the seventh of our online salons. I'm pretty sure that means that this one is lucky and so far I mean you haven't seen this but behind the scenes technically things have been going well so keep your fingers crossed that we don't have any issues for the rest of the evening. Uh, I'm Jordan Erica Weber. I am a writer and presenter. You may know me from my work on The Gadget Show uh, or on BBC Radio 4 or maybe you know me from that time that I got to go to Sarajevo back in 2018 to participate in Play UK in person. Uh, if you don't know Play UK is the British Council's platform supporting creativity in digital art and video games in the Western Balkans. Uh, in previous years, Play UK has taken place in locations across the Western Balkans, but this edition, of course, takes place online. Uh, it offers a spectacular lineup of fortnightly speaker salons, a mentorship program, and an upcoming virtual showcase, which is something to get excited about. Uh, I am very excited to be hosting today's online salon, which is all about the level design of Fall Guys, which is, of course, the phenomenal massively multiplayer party game that took the world by storm last summer. And you can see it behind me. Not the game, just a picture. I've not been playing Fall Guys until this has gone live, don't worry. <laughs> Uh, so today you are going to hear from two experts from Mediatonic, which is the studio behind the game. We have got senior level designer Ben Nizan and client engineer Alex Whaley. So after Ben and Alex have talked us through the level design of Fall Guys, you will get a chance to ask them your questions. So anytime you think of a question, just type it into the Q&A and we will run through them all at the end. Uh, Fall Guys is obviously a game with a lot going on under the hood. It's more complex than it looks. So there are lots of learning opportunities here for those of you who also make games or would like to in future. But uh, you don't need to hear that from me when the real experts are waiting in the wings. So Ben and Alex, welcome to Play UK and uh, over to you. Thank you so much for having us. It's really great uh, to be here. Uh, I'm Alex, by the way. Um, I am client engineer at Mediatonic. We'll give ourselves a bit more of an introduction in a second, but hopefully we can kind of talk you through, give you an insight into uh, what our level design process is um, kind of like. Hmm. And I'm the voice of Ben, and these will be our introductions. So, awesome. So, I'm Alex. Um, I've been working on Full Guys for just over a year and a half now. Before that, I worked on Yahtzee with Buddies. Um, I'm currently a client engineer who's um, leading the Levels engineering team. Um, there's four of us now. We've recently expanded, which is quite exciting. Um, when I first started on the team, I think I was probably the fourth internal client engineer. So it's really quite a big difference from when we first started leading a team of four people versus being the fourth engineer to actually be on the team. Um, I've been with Mediatonic for four years now since I graduated University of Bath in 2017. I studied um, a bachelor's in computer science. Um, and then some fun facts about me. Uh, my favorite game is Tekken 7. It's kind of a love-hate relationship. It's a wonderful game though. Um, and Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker is my favorite Legend of Zelda game and objectively the best Legend of Zelda game. Um, <laughs> I'm also a lover of board games. If you could see me, the wall behind me is full of board games. And uh, yeah, I love the physical medium as much as uh, digital games too. Cool. And hey, again, so I'm the voice of Ben. I don't think you can see us. You might see us later on. Um, I've been on Fall Guys for two years now. Um, I was the third game designer to join the project um, when things were kind of generalists. So we would be doing features and levels. Team's grown a lot now. So um, I'm leading the team of five uh, level designers. And then there's a team of, I'm going to get this number wrong, four uh, regular uh, game designers who are working on the features so the game design team is pretty massive now along with the rest of the full guys team um i also worked on the arts with buddies with alex um for a year before that um so he's been at mediatonic a little longer than i have um but prior to that i've been making games since 2011 started off making a game no one will have ever heard of called here be monsters which used to be a facebook game if you remember what those are uh, and then since then i've been an independent designer and coded some games myself as well and recently was working at uh, Endemol Shine, who you may know is the TV company that makes just about everything on the TV um, and worked with brands such as Mr Bean and Simon's Cat. And yeah, fact about me, I'm a big World of Warcraft fan, although I have to say I have been stolen away by Final Fantasy 14 recently and I can't get enough of it. Um, and I cannot wait to go to music festivals again when that's allowed. Um, hopefully this year, who knows, we'll see. 
Can't can't believe you betrayed World of Warcraft. Outrageous. I know. Anyway. I haven't fully. I haven't fully. Anyway, let's not derail. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So this talk, we've done our introductions, but we'll talk a little bit more about Mediatonic and the Four Guys project just to get people up to speed. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the different stages of what goes into making a level. So pre-production, production and the aftercare as well. Um, so um, who are Mediatonic? Hopefully you have played one of the games on here or heard about them. Um, Mediatonic are 15 years old now, I think. Is that right, Alex? Um, they've very made old. very old, 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 old independent company, and they've made all kinds of things. Amateur Surgeons, one of the first games with Adult Swim. Um, they've also worked um, on the Gears franchise and um, Fable. Um, but I think the one that gets people most of the time is Hato for Boyfriend, which was the port of the Japanese pigeon dating simulator, um, which is just fantastic. And then of course we had Murder by Numbers as well um, last year, um, which is our uh, Pit Cross detective game, which is absolutely fantastic. So if I can plug that, I will. Um, <laughs> and then Yahtzee, which we both worked on. Um, Murder by Numbers is a wonderful game. It really it's is. It's fantastic, definitely definitely play it. I know this is meant to be a Four Guys talk, but you should definitely play that. Um, but the game um, that we're here to talk about is Four Guys. So this was released uh, last year. Um, this is a quote from Polygon, which I think sums it up perfectly. Um, you probably all have had a look at it by now. It's kind of everywhere. That is our um, obstacle course battle royale, I suppose, is the way to describe it. Um, yeah. Awesome. So I'm going to throw some numbers at you, which are big and very surprising to all of us. Um, maybe not the fact we released in August 2020. Um, we sold over 10 million copies on Steam, which I think is way more than anyone ever expected. Um, there have been hundreds of thousands of people playing our game at any one time across the world on both PlayStation and um, Steam. Um, we're the most downloaded free game on PlayStation Plus ever. I believe was that overtaking Rocket League, Ben? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, which is wild. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just <laughs> glad that everyone's got to enjoy our game that had PlayStation Plus. It's really cool. Um, kind of gone over how we exceeded our wild expect wildest expectations fivefold in the first week. Really, I think it just went above and beyond what anyone was expecting. And it's, yeah, it's certainly been a ride since then. Um, the community team, um, our Mediatonic, raised a million dollars for the charity special effect. I believe that was a kind of bidding war that went on on Twitter. I'm sure some of you probably saw it happening and yeah, it was absolutely crazy. Uh, we're currently working on our third season, which is called Winter Knockout. Um, it's kind of snow themed um, season and there's a bunch more on the way. Um, I can't give away too much, but the current season we're working on is super exciting and you're all gonna love it. Um, yeah, uh, the game was in development for about two years before initial launch. Uh, if you saw the game two years ago versus how it looks now, you would be very surprised. Um, I'm sure we're gonna have some GIFs and images in the slides that kind of show off how the game did look and it's shocking, truly. Um, the core team grew to about 40-ish people, I think, at its pre-launch peak, um, a kind of number that you could fit in a single room and not be uncomfortable. Um, now that's absolutely definitely not possible. We have over 100 people and a whole bunch of them have been hired over lockdown and unfortunately we've not even got to meet some of them. Um, we're really looking forward to that ending and well, things going back to normal and being able to meet all the wonderful people we work with. Yeah and celebrate as well because we've not been able to do that yet really. Yeah <laughs> that'll be fun. <laughs> Um, so the game, to go back to a little bit about what it is, it, there's no hiding it that it is a it's a game show and I think of all of the game shows Takeshi's Castle is the one that's the, the craziest and most contemporary that people may know. Um, I think it's called MXC in other countries um, and it has, must have other names as well um, but this gif kind of epitomises it right, throwing boulders at people and seeing them fall down a mountain which is you know these fall a mountain and um, there are other game shows like this though that we draw our inspiration from um, so there's an even older show called uh, it's a knockout in the UK um, and the US has got total wipeout as well which is a little less wacky on the on the costumes and things but definitely more in the way of hitting people they really hit them hard in that show it's yeah and we're always looking at these shows um, for inspiration and from kids games and things like that as well um, Cool. Yeah. So as a live game, Fall Guys is never finished. I mean, you're probably aware of the kind of seasonal structure that we have. We're constantly putting out new content. And generally speaking, that's all back to back. Like whilst season three is being 
prepared and getting ready to be released to everyone. We're working on season four already. And then further down the pipeline, we're thinking about season five and how that's going to look and what it builds up. Cool. So now I guess we're moving on to pre-production. And I guess from the perspective of levels in engineering, which is who me and Ben are, this is where the bulk of the work happens. Um, I think this is really where when creating levels, this is yeah, exactly where the majority of the work comes comes from. Um, so there's five stages. We start with researching, brainstorming and pitching. Um, this is really where the designers are pulling most of the weight, um, creating new level ideas, often um, inspired by some of the shows that Ben's been talking about, other times drawing ideas from the theme of the season, say we're talking about um, Winter Knockout, just coming up with ideas that make sense for that kind of uh, seasonal design. Uh, then we move on to prototyping and the paper design. Uh, we'll go into a bunch more detail on how all this works um, shortly, um, but this is really um, just creating the very first uh, prototypes um, for this. Cool. Uh, and then beyond that, we have the level blockouts, which are created with uh, minimal viable mechanics. Once we put together the prototype functionality, Ben is and his team are taking away what we make and turning that into actual levels. Um, following that, we have playtesting and iteration, which is taking the block out levels that we've created. The design team and the QA team are um, just playtesting those closer to capacity, the kind of numbers that we're actually expecting people to um, play this level with um, when we finally release it into the world. Um, and then the last stage of pre-production is the sign off where we um, all of the, uh, what would you call it, Ben, I guess disciplines come together yeah. <laughs> and um, finally sign off a level. It's kind of a verbal agreement that we're all happy with the state of things um, and then we're moving on from there. Cool. So we'll go into a bit more detail about these phases now and we've also got pictures and things to look at too. Um, so pitching really is the first part um, of the pipeline and um, Alex, as Alex said, this mostly involves the designers. Um, we have five pillars that we try to hit for all of our levels. So this is whenever we have an idea, we kind of measure it against these things and as much as possible try to um, try to match these. And I think some levels um, do better at these than others. And I think that's OK, because one of the things we're also going for is, is variety. But generally speaking, um, the game does have skill elements. And I think what's been nice about Fall Guys is we've managed to open up to quite a wide audience. And a lot of people who um, don't necessarily play games or even platforming games have been coming to Fall Guys. Um, so there is still quite a lot of skill in there, but it, because there's the element of chaos and chance, people feel encouraged. And one of the things as well was to make sure that um, even failing is fun. So the Fall Guys made to look funny and cute even when they fall over it, and that's to encourage people to get better at the game. But the chaos kind of, uh, uh, helps with that and the slapstick moments also plays into that so that's what makes it look fun when the player gets hit by something you kind of you will laugh at yourself for failing but also the important thing for that was to make the game um viewable on places like uh, twitch and youtube uh, it is a game show so as much as the game is meant to be fun to play it's meant to be fun to watch um, i have the gif at the bottom here from it's a knockout which started in the 1960s actually which is crazy um that show they would take a film crew to a random village in the UK and they would get the whole town out to the to the school field or whatever and put them in crazy costumes and they'd run around and I think this gif epitomizes the kind of chaos that we're trying to capture with four guys I mean even the camera crew are in the way and getting hit by these people in suits showing around is fantastic um but then we do have tension as well so I think this is quite a typical um gamey thing but we try to make sure that rounds um will get more tense as you go through they're very short they're only two minutes long so it's quite important to keep people's attention um, and to build things up but then one that's kind of specific to four guys is more the merrier so all of our rounds should feel better with having more people in them if if the round starts to feel crowded or that uh, having more people in the round is problematic then that's not really going to work for four guys not all of our rounds necessarily 60 people some are maybe only for 30 some for 20 but whatever, whatever size they work out it should feel good the more people are in there um, and play me again so uh, people should feel excited to play the same rounds over and over again and we do use things um, like variation where we'll change the obstacles and the way things spin um, but also those games should feel fun in the sense that when you play something like Mario Party for example you're going <coughs> to play them over and over again so this is the kind of thing that will match all of our initial ideas against um, we then it's quite 
dryly just have a spreadsheet where we put all of our ideas <laughs> and we will have meetings where we put them together um so again another click into keshi's castle at the bottom here or if you've played four guys doordash um and here are the first descriptions of some of the rounds in the game so save your tail uh, became sail tag conveyor belt became fruit shoot uh, DoorDash stayed as DoorDash, we kept the game, the name. And the floor is lava became um, the much loved slime climb. So this is kind of where these all started, probably a year and a half ago, I guess. Um, and then we have a spreadsheet full of these ideas that we go through. Um, and anyone in the company can add these as well. It tends to be the designers, but we do open up to other disciplines to give us their ideas. Um, and then the designers can go away and flesh those out because um, we'll run out of ideas eventually. That's why we hire new people all the time. Uh, we just <laughs> run dry. Um, then the pitch um, gets formalised. So from those original ideas, we will then write pitches. Um, these will have, uh, you know, a diagram to show the very basics. They don't need to be to scale at this point. They can just be sketches like this one here. Um, this is a sketch for Wall Guys, which uh, is also in the GIF next to it, um, which was one of the rounds we released in season two. Um, and in this, we just try to give enough detail. And the purpose of the pitch is to sell people on the idea, because of course everyone needs to be excited. But it's also to find the questions that need to be answered by prototyping. So for example, uh, you can see uh, me, the little pineapple, um, pulling some blocks up on top of ramps and on top of blocks, which if anyone's played wall guys is not something you can do. Um, and when we first prototyped this, it worked. Um, maybe Alex can talk a little bit more about why this isn't good. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Like um, when, when we played this offline, it was really fun. And like you can see from the gifts, it seems like something that would be really great. Um, but unfortunately, Fall Guys doesn't have the the leisure of being an offline game. And as soon as we took this online, um, dragging these physics objects on top of each other and kind of rotating them around really uh, didn't play nice. And we had kind of fairly explosive results. Um, we had platforms being launched up into the sky and players along with them. And yeah, really, it just wasn't wasn't great so we kind of had to set ourselves some technical limitations here freezing the blocks to kind of be aligned with the surface um but design make the most of those kind of calls that get made and maybe ben can talk a little bit more about the ramp specifically yeah so i mean it, those it was hilarious when that was happening we should probably just put that level in the game as a special bonus show to see how bad it goes wrong um yes yeah, so one of the compromises we made here which um is kind of uh, an example of the kind of compromises we'll make daily on things like this is that we said we would lock the blocks so that you couldn't drag them up and they can't move up and down. They can only move left and right, backwards and forwards, um, which was fine. Actually, the, the, the game wall guy still works. We didn't really need to be able to stack things. But one thing we did want is we wanted to have the ramps because they make it easy for the players to run up those. They're not having to climb up them. Um, and the thing with the ramps is that we don't want people to be able to pull blocks up them. Therefore, we put the little step along the bottom, um, which was kind of a smart way of allowing players to go up it, but blocks to not go up it. And I think a really nice example of how art, engineering and design came together to come up with that solution, um, which was really cool. Um, cool. Awesome. So the following slides are kind of the main takeaways from our prototyping process. They're things that we've kind of learned over um, just over the course of making Full Guys, basically. Um, Full Guys, in the kind of structure it is, is constantly in the prototyping phase. Unlike other ga games where you kind of have the luxury of prototyping things out and then going into your post, like, in your production kind of phase and then not really having to look at the uh, kind of prototyping structure, uh, Full Guys is constantly prototyping. All the new levels we make and all the new um, obstacles and mechanics are constantly prototyped from the ground up. Um, so the first thing to bear in mind really is that when we're prototyping new functionality, um, we should be looking for function over form. Um, when we're working on this stuff, it doesn't really matter how it looks. You can see from the bottom GIF here. Oh, my screen has frozen. I don't know if it has for anyone else. Yeah, it's frozen here too. Okay. Oh, well, um, hang on. on Let me try left. going back. Has that fixed it? Sorry, technical difficulties. No, I'm afraid not. No, it's still oh, frozen oh, here. Maybe try. Ah. unsharing and then sharing again i'm live now people are just seeing me <laughs> while you while we try and figure it out <laughs> sorry about that That's how's all right. it looking from you guys can you see it again no Still. unfortunately not Hang on. um yeah let's try let's try closing it and starting it all again sorry everyone <laughs> that's all right We've got some good questions coming in. Uh, so just a reminder for people that if you have questions that you want to ask Alex and Ben, type them into the Q&A uh, and I will. Oh, it's moving now. Yay, oh, good. Okay, how Fantastic. exciting. Right, yes. So, <laughs> uh, 
in this example, you can kind of see um, the flippers. If you played season three, you'll be familiar with them now, but they're, um, yeah, on the right, you can see the kind of arted, fully um, ready to go live version of the flippers. And on the left, we have what the early prototype looked like. So if you're familiar with tiptoe, you probably notice that that's actually just a tiptoe tile that we've kind of jammed in there and it's just simply rotating. But you will notice between the two that the physics functionality is consistent between the two. And really in the prototyping phase, all that matters is that we're proving out whether or not the concept of this obstacle or this level is actually fun. Um, and that's what matters. It doesn't matter if the visuals don't match so long as the mechanics are interesting. Um, and in this step, we're constantly iterating. There's a lot on back and forth, as Ben was saying, between design and engineers to constantly just be testing this and playing it and actually making sure that what we're implementing is fun and we're getting the most out of it. Cool. Uh, the next thing we do is we kind of ident identify what the min spec implementation of our new functionality in levels and obstacles is. So this is basically just figuring out what the minimum um, set of features for a new obstacle or level is to figure out whether or not the concept is fun. Um, I guess using the flippers as an example, they, we could do a lot of work to add a bunch of functionality like making the flippers flip in random directions or have very specific timing, etc. But none of that really helps us identify whether or not having a flipper in the level is fun. Um, and what the min spec implementation or identifying what that is, is about is really just figuring out what work we need to do to figure out whether or not that obstacle is fun. In the case of the flipper, that's just making an object that when you stand on it, flips the player. Is that fun to use? Is that fun to put in a level? Um, and then once we figure that out, um, we take it forward and we go from there. And later in production, we implement more functionality. Um, I guess another little point is sometimes we do that and the levels don't make the cut. Not everything that we implement works. You know, sometimes we make things that aren't actually that fun. And Below, you can kind of see some examples of some levels that didn't make it to the final game. We have one affectionately referred to as musical squares in the bottom, which is kind of a, a dance floor where parts disappear. Uh, maybe it will return one day, who knows? Um, and another one that I cannot remember the name of, but sort of merged into um, our new final round, which is called Thin Ice. I think it stole the name from the prototype for this, which was different. But anyway, that's fine. It lives on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yes, so I kind of touched on this briefly before, but it's really important in the prototyping phase that the physics and behavior of these objects that we're creating strongly or as close to as possible reflects what we're expecting the final implementation to look like. If we implement something and then completely change the behavior in the production phase, it has very potentially catastrophic knock-on effects. Designers are going to be using the work that we create to build entire level designs if we later come to those objects and we decide that they function completely differently, let's say the flipper, for example, now launches you twice as far, the whole level design has to change because the structure and the setup of the geometry is all set up in a way that like lends itself to the, the way those obstacles and those levels have been created. So if this is something you're looking at doing, I would strongly recommend that that's something you bear in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one, this is kind of an example of something that we learned the hard way, um, is that when you're making your prototyping or your prototype objects and your level functionality, it can be easy to just kind of throw together um, obstacles in a haphazard way that kind of implements the functionality, but leaves some inconsistencies. In this case, the objects being different sizes, as you can kind of see between the two GIFs, we have the fans on the bottom left that are very thin and the fans on the right that are actually very chunky. We had level designers create entire levels with the thin fans only for the fans to be made by our quite a lot thicker, which meant everything had to be restructured and replaced and cause us a lot of headache. So something worth bearing in mind. Yeah, one of the key themes in this is communication. So now we try to make sure we get uh, art design and engineering just talking about, you know, ahead of time, what shape those things need to be as early as possible. Um, so one of the things that designers do as well is a kind of a different form of prototyping, but we will do top down designs um, or you might hear them called paper designs. Um, and this is to try and solve problems before we get into 3D and before sometimes we have the mechanics. So the engineers will be working on um, the obstacles, even the flippers or the fans. They're not going to exist yet, but it doesn't mean that designers can't start thinking about how we're going to lay those things out and, you know, imagining that they do. We're always imagining things, pretend it's a board game or whatever. Um, here's some various top down designs for the round uh, Hoopsie Daisy, which launched in, not Hoopsie Daisy, Hoopsie Legends, which launched in season two, um, which are kind of just looking at different layouts 
um, of how those arenas were going to be um, before we even had anything really working for the scoring system and the hoops and all that kind of stuff. Um, what it also means is, as well as the kind of theory crafting of the designer putting these together, it opens up discussion. So it allows everyone from all disciplines to kind of pick them apart and suddenly things aren't so theoretical anymore. You've got something to kind of point at and look at and go, hey, well, those blocks are this size. So you're not going to be able to fit 10 of them in an arena if the arena also has to be this size and things like that. Um, so that's a really important first step. And then once we're kind of happy with something, we will then move on to blockouts, which is where we then get into the engine. So um, as much as top downs are useful, there are some things you are only going to realize once you actually get into 3D because you, it's just your brain is working in a different space. Um, but hopefully you've answered um, a bunch of your questions already. Um, so you've got a pretty good idea of what you need. So then the things you are finding out at this stage uh, are the things you would only find out at this stage. An important thing for blockouts, you might hear them called white boxes as well, um, are to use simple shapes where possible. You're not using the final artwork. Um, Although in Fall Guys, because the game is so blocky and everything's kind of made out of crash mats, a lot of the time our simple shapes are the ones that are used with the um, nice textures and things on top of them, which is always a little daunting. So you do have to have an eye as a designer to make things look uh, a little bit nice. Um, but this is where, again, you're going to make something and you can play it. So here you can see in this GIF, we've got the hoops working, um, we've got the blocks moving around, we've got the layout, and that means we can start playing and finding the problems. And then again, just keep iterating and discussing. Um, and here's one of the fabled gifts from a long time ago. So on the left hand side is the first ever tail tag. So the arena was very different. Um, the hammers you can see are very low poly uh, and even the tails. Well, they were all like tails from Sonic, oh, I think. I don't know if that was the intention. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, and I think the thing in the middle spun when you ran on it, which then ended up being a problem. So I think we just put a massive hammer in there instead. But there you go. This is how different the game looks two years on or whatever it is. Um, Cool. And then playtesting, of course, is important. So playtesting happens at every single stage. You, you always need to keep playing um, playing the game and finding problems. But particularly once there is a block out, now you've finally got a full level with its mechanics in, or at least the minimum versions of that. Um, and now you're going to start getting in front of more people. Um, we tend to do small tests first. So with designers and the engineers, which is more of a peer review. So that's just checking, does you know, does the design make sense? Picking things apart in that way. Um, but there's only a few of us. so. You know, Fall Guys is a multiplayer game, you need more people. So then when we're kind of happy, we'll move on to the team and studio tests to start getting feedback from players, um, our colleagues, but they work on other projects. So it can be a little bit unbiased, which is good. People don't hold back in the feedback either. Um, and then we will eventually do a community test. Um, once we're happy, we've got stuff, we'll get it in front of people for a beta test effectively. Um, but the key things for any testing is to figure out what questions you want to answer. Um, if you just go in and ask people if it's fun, that's usually not good enough. You need to, because they'll just say yes or no, which isn't particularly useful. If you ask people about particular parts of the level, um, what things uh, what things they like and don't, that's useful. Or if you do op uh, give an open-ended question, like, did you find it fun? Know what you're looking out for in the answers as well. So you can do that literally with a survey, or you can actually just watch people and see what they do. Some of the most useful things we get are, are videos people take of themselves playing the game, and you can watch their character run around like they're confused, and that's useful for setting you when the people are confused. Um, with surveys, you will get loads of different feedback, and I tend to find generally people know they don't like something they usually don't know what it is they don't like even if they tell you they do um but if 10 people dislike the same thing then it's wrong and you should probably change it if those 10 people dislike different things then they're also not wrong you should think about what's common to those things that they don't like and um, because there's usually something under the surface that you can triangulate and fix um for example people might think this you know this level is too uh, slow, it takes too long to get through. And I think you should put a conveyor belt in it to speed things up. And actually what you need to do is remove some walls or whatever it is. Um, and you can usually find that by asking as many people as possible. Awesome. So by this point, we've finished our prototyping. There's been a lot of iteration between engineers and design to come to kind of the finalized um, prototype versions of our levels and our obstacles. Um, we've run play tests to ensure there's stability with what we're working on and that um, people playing the levels actually enjoy what we're making. Um, by this point, we're hoping to move everything from where we're at to post-production, which is where um, things get arted and we'll go over a lot more of that in a second. But this step is vital in ensuring that everyone who's a stakeholder in what we're making um, is agreeing that things are in a state that they're happy 
to take forward. Um, we'll have tech leads in here. I'll be there. Ben will be there. Um, other people like Joe will be there. Um, and everyone will be, this is kind of a verbal agreement that the state of things are good to progress, basically. Um, from the tech side of things, we're thinking about performance um, and physics stability. It's no good us taking a level that's really fun to play um, and it not going in front of engineers to get an idea of whether or not um, we think it's actually going to be stable to run on a server. These are the kind of things that need to be flagged up um, at this state in the stage in the process. Um, if there are no issues, then things progress. I think the key thing here as well is from a production's point of view, a lot more people are about to get involved in making this level. So it's about to get very expensive. So you want to make sure you're committing <laughs> to the yes, right thing. Exactly. And like and leading off that point, especially with stuff like the geo of a level, if we sign off a level and we say, OK, the, like this level is ready to go. And then the artists start making all the geometry for a level for us to a week later change the entire thing that it's, throws them under the bus a bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. So in the production phase, people start working a lot more in parallel. The people by previous stages we, we were talking about are mostly kind of done in sequence as that's kind of the order that things have to be done in order for them to actually get made. Um, but once we get to production, things start happening a bit more in parallel. Um, once the sign off is done, design provide art with a kind of picture of the level, which art then take away and turn into a concept, which is themed to whatever our given theme is. Um, and then the 3D team will start making 3D models based on the concepts. Engineers will be bug fixing and improving performance and stability, as well as adding those extra kind of stretch features that we talked about earlier that weren't vital to the prototypes. Um, designers will be tweaking the design and balance, but mostly not major changes, definitely not to the geometry of the level at this point. Um, and then QA really start getting involved and making sure that the thing that we're getting ready to put out isn't broken and on fire, which often it is. <laughs> it always is, but then we put the fire out and that's what it's yep, all about. Of right? course. Um, cool. So we'll go through those uh, sections a bit more detail as well. So um, neither myself or Alex are artists, but of course we work with the artists. So this will be from um, our point of view, but you could get the artists here to talk to you for 40 minutes about their whole process because um, a lot goes into it. So I just want to just highlight that we're not glossing over it on purpose. <laughs> it's important. But um, as Alex mentioned, we and the designers then will take our 3D blockouts and we will annotate them effectively and just explain which parts of the level really shouldn't change. So so, um, you know, this corner needs to be like this because uh, blah, blah, blah. And here's the reason for it. Um, you know, people need to be able to roll down this ramp. So please don't make it flat, for example. Um, <laughs> but then you can also call out the parts which can be modified. So a lot of the time, you know, the designers have 3D skills, but we're not 3D artists. So we will make things with sharp corners while most of the time in Fall Guys, we want things to be soft. Um, so, you know, that's an example of something we'll call out um, that can be changed. Or, for example, we might put just a block as a something you know this is to get in the way of the players and so that they can't pull, push a ball around it you can change the block into a tree or into a boulder or into whatever you like um so it's kind of highlighting that stuff for that collaboration the artists will then go away and make the concept arts that's the bottom left here um so they'll kind of draw over our 3d and decide what the colors are going to be and wh what symbols are going to go around we try to make sure in four guys that the levels really explain themselves. Um, so we have arrows and um, things around and we use color coding and patterns to show where things are and what way people need to go. And that's kind of over to the concept artists to decide that stuff and the designers will work with them as well to figure out what's the best. And then this is the bit where it's draw the rest of the owl, but then the very large art team, there's probably twice if not three times as many of them as there are the engineers and designers will go away and create all of the wonderful art and textures so you get the beautiful game uh, as it is in the bottom right but i'm sorry to do them a disservice by not going into their process too much um cool but it does look absolutely beautiful so they're doing a fantastic job um once the concepts are done and then 3d have created models the engineering team is kind of responsible for um basically hooking things up. We kind of showed you the prototypes earlier where they don't really have, well, they don't look very nice. Um, in the bottom left, you can kind of see the punches that we have for season three. You may notice them from Slime Climb. They're just blocks that we repurposed and they just kind of shunt out, which is not very exciting, but it functionally does exactly the same thing as the image on the right. Um, when we're doing this, we're also integrating VFX as they come in from our VFX team. Um, and yeah, the only other thing of note here really is that we tried to set up our prototypes in a way that the 
visual changes that come in are completely silent from um, the behavioral changes or the physics behavior. Um, if the two are too closely connected, if you have your visuals and your physics objects too entwined with one another, it becomes very difficult to pick apart. So we tried to do our best to keep the two separate so that when the new visuals come in, even if the implementation is completely different, like you can see for the box on the right, it's got like this punching arm and it almost behaves like a TARDIS. It's completely different to what's on the left. The visuals don't affect how the physics end up resolving in the end. Um, yeah, nice little bit of code magic that makes the uh, glove fit in the box that's obviously not big enough. Yeah, I don't know how you actually did that, but <laughs> magic. No, fantastic. Yeah, magic. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, we talked about iterating a lot earlier, and whilst most of the iteration does happen in the prototyping phase, the iteration doesn't end at production. Um, obviously, we're going to be running more play tests. Things are going to be changing. The visuals are going to be changing. There's still a lot of iteration that happens based on yeah, those things. Um, ideally, when we're setting up our prototyped objects, we try to do our best to expose everything that designers are ever going to need to them so that there's never a need to change the code. Um, I'm sure people who are engineers are familiar with like exposing your values, using data objects like scriptable objects. Um, we do our best to kind of over engineer the exposed functionalities to the designers a little bit if possible. Um, it's better to assume that literally anything could change than thinking this definitely won't change and then it obviously changes because that's just how de game development goes. Um, so yeah, we do our best to keep everything flexible so that the designers can change things in ways that aren't going to break functionality later on. And designers will try to break everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, which leads into this slide quite well. So balancing is the main thing that designers are doing at this stage. So um, we're generally not moving geometry around in the scene. We should have locked that down for the reasons we talked about before, because that means that the artists are going away and making that stuff. And if we change it, it's going to be really problematic. Sometimes it has to happen, though. Um, but the kind of things that we can change and that are important to change are the placement and the behavior of dynamic objects. So things like hammers, for example, in Four Guys, they can be placed anywhere in the scene and um, beyond the scene and the hammer being made, they those relationships uh they're untied from each other so we can put the hammers wherever we like we can move those things around and we can also change things about the objects so how fast they move or how fast they rotate and the timing of doors and cannons and things like that and um, so when we're at that sign off stage previously we you know we'll agree okay so the timing of these doors isn't right but we have the technology we need or we're going to have the technology we need from the engineers to be able to um, set up what we need but it's not going to impact the art team so they can go ahead and do their stuff and that's, I think that's really important to make those distinctions um yeah slipperiness and bounciness or other things and then also stuff that's kind of meta to the level so it's not actually in the scene itself but things like um how long is the round how many people are in the round um how rare you know are the golden hoops for example and one of the things it, it was kind of a slightly weird analogy but you're you're balancing the soup so how hot is goldilocks's soup going to be and the thing with this is that you in a game like Four Guys, it's really hard to get a capacity test. So getting 60 people in um, in a level obviously is all of those people's time. So you need to use their time wisely. And if you're just guessing um, at how, how hot the soup is or how fast the hammer needs to be, um, then you're gonna be there all day. So the best thing to do from my experience is to put in uh, some soup that's obviously too hot and obviously too cold and then see how people react to those because then the one that people tend to like most you know you can move in that direction and then you can keep um putting soup i'm using soup as the analogy that could be a spinning <laughs> hammer you know halfway between where people feel okay and where they feel it's too much and then you can keep um kind of bouncing between those values um but yeah test the extremes i guess is the takeaway from that not not soup yeah I don't know, there might be a new soup based game mode on the horizon, who knows? Uh, we'll run out of ideas eventually, I'm sure there will be. <laughs> awesome. um, uh, cool, so I won't go into this in too much detail, but a big chunk of the engineer's time in production is optimization. We can come up with the most wonderful ideas in the world. We could put hundreds and hundreds of objects in a scene that are all networked, but if it never runs on the server and it doesn't run on the client, then it's not really any good to anybody. Um, it can be super fun locally, but if it doesn't feel good over the network, then it's not gonna be a fun experience. Ultimately, profiling on both the client and the server and kind of meeting needs in both cases is super important to making sure that we deliver an experience to players that's both reliable and feels good, um, which isn't always difficult, like easy, um, but yeah, we do a lot of things to kind of mitigate those uh, those issues. Um, the first thing that we do is we profile to our base case. 
which is the base PlayStation 4. It's kind of a requirement really that Fall Guys is always running and looking good on the base PlayStation 4. Um, that's our kind of target lowest end. We don't typically target any lower for PC. Um, a PC that performs about as well as a base PS4 should be running the game fine. Um, another important part of profiling in terms of the whole process is just making sure that it fits into your schedule. Um, it's really easy to schedule the other stuff in, but you need to make sure that you're investing time into making sure that your levels do actually run properly and not just doing it um, at the end, uh, if possible. Um, I kind of skipped pooling VFX because I know we're a little short on time at the minute and I'll, I'll go over more uh, the networking improvement stuff since that's a little bit more interesting, I think. Um, yeah, we're actively always doing our best to kind of reduce the total outgoing server bandwidth. When you have a game like Fall Guys, which is kind of middle multiplayer, if that's a word and phrase people use these days, where it's like 60 people in a game, it's really important that the server's not having to work too hard. It's not sending too many messages too frequently and getting overloaded. Um, we do a lot of work to mitigate that, and I'll kind of go over in a little bit more detail in the next slide kind of what that's about um, and some other kind of related topics. Uh, yes, so we have set up a system that lets us have um, configurable send rates for some of our networked objects. It's not always the case that we just want to reduce networking traffic. Sometimes it's more important that we actually send more networking data to make the objects in the level more responsive. So I guess a great example of this is full ball. It doesn't really matter if the balls look really smooth if they suck to actually jump into. If you hit a ball and then it reacts a whole second later, nobody's <laughs> going to have fun playing that level. Um, so yeah, we've invested some work into making sure that the responsiveness of our objects is configurable on a basis that's relative to how many of those objects we have in a level. For example, egg grab, the eggs are slightly less responsive, but there's so many of them that we can't really afford to make them as responsive as the balls are, for example. Um, and then sometimes you just have to be a little bit smarter. You just have to actually think about what your alternative solutions are. The first point in the uh, does this object need to be sending continuous data um, about is local good enough is actually ties in quite nicely to the image on the right. Um, if you're familiar with DoorDash, the real doors have these little fake pieces um, or these little door pieces that when you smash through the doors, they kind of fly off everywhere. In our first prototypes, each of the pieces was networked. So we had DoorDash filled with hundreds and hundreds of little networked pieces. And it was no surprise that when we tested this at 100 players, the level just crashed. Um, so eventually we ended up implementing these completely locally. We sync across all the clients that the door has broken, but beyond that, the pieces themselves just resolve and drop on the floor locally and it will be different for each client. Um, and then sometimes we optimize things by just deriving their behavior from the server clock. So hammers, pendulums, etc. cetera, um, their behavior can just be derived from a time that's kind of kept in check by the server. Um, and then sometimes we just put objects to sleep and egg doesn't need to send any data about where it is if it's not moving anywhere. Um, yeah, sleepy eggs. <laughs> sleepy eggs, yeah. <laughs> um, so bug fixing is a big part of production. Um, we've got some funny gifts to show you as well, but the main thing is that everyone kind of gets fixed on the, uh, gets involved with fixing these. Um, so engineers, obviously anything to do with code, designers will get in the engine as well. So anything to do with collisions between objects um, or setting up variation um, or anything, you know, numerical and stuff like that will usually be involved with. And the artists, anything to do with the models, or the lighting, um, they will get involved. And if everyone has a little bit of each other's skills, it obviously makes stuff easier as well. Um, so I think we've got some funny bugs to show. Yeah, <laughs> I can like. <laughs> so this one we refer to affectionately as the hatching. I think we made some um, changes to how we network our scale and uh, well, had pretty disastrous results on this level in particular. Um, and I think this one was not fixed for a surprisingly long amount of time. There was yeah. like, like a good week where the eggs were all just like mutating and four times the size they're supposed to be. But it makes for a great gift. So it's a good gift and it knocks it knocks the pendulums as well. Um, flying Sonic. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's Sonic flying. When we implemented the fans. There was a bug where the uh, forces never stopped being applying. And well, yeah, you can see you just kind of fly forever. Maybe this will be a future game mode. Yeah, notes. maybe we should do that. I'm going to put that on my put that in my notebook. Love it. <laughs> this, this one, the Apex Twin one, right? <laughs> yeah. Your guess is as good as mine as to what was happening with this one. This is early for guys, and um, well, yeah, you've seen better days. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and this one's just kind of cute, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. think this was when we had our uh, old skeleton um, slash ragdoll system in the game, and it's just kind of jiggly, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's cool. Teeth on a toucan. Who knew? Cool. Do, do toucan have teeth, Jordan? Oh gosh, you put me on the spot now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say yes. Probably not like that though. Not like that. Probably not like that. Um, and yeah. And yeah. Once there's a hole. There's yeah. Hole where the butt should be. <laughs> See, these things happen a lot. There's yep. uh, lots of moving parts in the foreguy and sometimes bits disappear. Um, uh, the kind of last thing is we have to name everything, which, uh, as you can see on the conversation on the left, is done fully professionally, uh, where the designers have very chin strokey conversations about what we'll call things. It's very serious business. Um, but jokes aside, the game is playable in a bunch of different languages, so it's important that we get these right and get them done early because we need to send them off to our localizers um, to translate it into all kinds of different languages that we can't read, so we need to make sure they're doing it correctly. Um, so we send through really detailed notes, particularly around any wordplay, because not everything, of course, translates literally. Uh, one of the worst offenders I heard of was our round called Big Fans, which is called as such because there are big fans in it. And also it's a play on being someone's biggest fan, got translated into a language as Lovers of Giants, which <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know until someone who spoke that language very rightly sent us an angry uh, email saying that we didn't take proper care, which we didn't in that circumstance. And we are fixing that one. Um, I mean, it's a difficult one to get right, but we try to do our best. But yeah, naming things is difficult. Um, so there's a little bit more to um, after release. So, for example, fixing bad names is one thing, um, but the fun doesn't stop there. Yeah, for sure. So at this point, like the levels and the obstacles have kind of gone live. They're out in the wild. And um, yeah, obviously, if there are major issues and things come up or even minor issues, we do our best to fix those. But it's not always quite that easy. Sometimes if you're working with um, changes especially to the character and the levels and you're changing behavior that players are familiar with and used to it becomes very difficult to then change that to something that you objectively think is better or correct because a whole a wide array of people are now used to it or like it are familiar with it and it can be very dangerous to just go in and kind of change those things in the live game so we have to be careful about um fixing things obviously if the character is exploding and flying off into the stratosphere that's a <laughs> no-brainer that we'll fix it but for more minor things around like how grab interactions work or like how specific timings are set up on levels those are things that people get used to and we kind of have to be careful about changing those um we also have something internally which we call our content management service which is basically uh, we access it through a website but it's kind of uh, an external service that allows us to change and configure values that drive lots of gameplay slash level related functionality so this lets us do things like change how many people qualify in a round if we're finding that like a level is too hard or it's disqualifying too many people or our shows aren't progressing in a way that feels good and we're getting good variety in the live game we're able to kind of change values that let us adjust those things in real time um, with the new variation system it also lets us do things like creating new content and creating new shows that can actually have completely new um, setups for variation within a level that's kind of hard um, coded like you could get um, full mountains with specifically hammers in a specific tournament all the time. That's kind of something that we can do with this. Um, yeah. So if you ever get that little thing saying there has been a content update, we fiddled or something. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and this is the last bit here, but um, it's a big slide. Sorry, it's too much text here. I should have bullet pointed it. But um, the kind of last step is analytics and research. So we track um, things in the game, such as how often people see each level, um, how much a level like Slime Climb, how many people it eliminates, because it can eliminate any number of any number of people. Um, how many players tend to get to each level because of course we have this system that is picking the levels um, on the fly so it sees how many people there are and what kind of rounds you've been playing and then it will pick it we call it the director um, and of course we have models and simulations for how that stuff works but it, you know the, the true test is doing the analytics and seeing what actually happens um, and then through our content management system we can adjust that stuff and it's important not to be led by numbers it, whatever it is um, because you need to understand why the numbers are like they are thankfully we have a growing analytics team who are good at doing that thing so they can tell us what the numbers mean which is very useful um, and we also do community surveys and the community team will be looking on uh, Twitter and TikTok and Instagram for people's feedback and doing some sentiment readings around how people feel about the levels so more than just the numbers actually how people are enjoying it and highlighting any you know bad issues and bugs um, and again though it's important not to be led by the most vocal players because for everyone on Twitter that's very passionate and giving their feedback there are millions of people who 
don't even know there's a Twitter account and but are still playing the game, um, you know, dozens of hours a week. Um, so we try to do our best to get in touch with those players. And I think we're doing a bit more community outreach um, recently to kind of get in touch with people who maybe otherwise aren't so vocal. So we can make sure that the game is fun for everyone, which is the important thing. Um, so in conclusion, the, the kind of three stages, I've called the third on aftercare, I don't think that's what it's actually called, but I've called it that, um, is pre-production, which is to sell people on ideas and to find all of your questions and answer them um, as efficiently as possible. And um, because you're going to have, that's when the, the team is the smallest working on a level. So together you need to figure that stuff out. And um, production, that's when now more people are joining so that, you know, there could be dozens of people working on a particular level. So at this stage, anything you change is going to be expensive and problematic and cause people headaches. But you often have to change things. You're never going to get everything right the first time. So communication is really key. And then after a level is released, as we said, there is more to be done. Um, and then we will fold, fold all that back into the process and start again uh, for the next mm -hmm. season. Um, cool. Well, thank you for listening. So back over to you, Jordan. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben and Alex. What a wonderful presentation. I've learned so much. Uh, which is just incredible because, you know, I've played a lot of Fall Guys, obviously, because it's an incredible game and everyone's been playing it. Um, but I've definitely wondered how certain things work and, you know, the stuff about local objects and, uh, you know, the eggs going to sleep and things like that <laughs> is definitely something I'll remember and not something I had figured out for myself, not being a game designer. Uh, now, we have a lot of people uh, watching this and people are sending in questions. If you haven't sent in a question yet and you've got one in your head, make sure to type it into the Q&A. Um, but we've got a few that we can go through if Alex and Ben are ready. Yeah, make sure you've drunk some water because you've just been talking for quite a long yeah, time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this first one here, this is something that I think a lot of people have probably wondered. Um, and it's something that I was thinking as well. And that is, how has the culture of the design team changed as the team size has grown? And then a second part also as things have shifted virtually. So there's kind of two parts to that question. Yeah, I think, um, well, I guess this will go for all the teams. I'll talk about the design team and maybe you can talk about a bit about the engineering team, Alex. But um, I think actually it's the second part of that, which is the trickiest one, right? So we built the game in lockdown, basically, because we released in August um, and the UK went into lockdown in March. So from that point onwards, we didn't get to see each other, um, which is, you know, that's the most critical part of making a game. And during that time, we had a few more designers meet the project. And obviously you do your best to try and integrate people into the fold. Um, but it's really difficult when you <laughs> can't actually see your colleagues in a room. Um, I think the biggest change to the design team though, aside from lockdown, is the fact that we now have split into features and levels. Um, we were all kind of generalists and all working on different stuff, and now the game is so big and the expectation is so higher, um, so much higher. We've had to specialise a little bit. So I used to be generalist and feature designer, and now I'm leading the levels team, and we have specifically um, level designers now, so they can bring the, that experience uh, specifically and the features the same. Which I think the trick for us, and this is something we're still having to figure out, is making sure though that we still communicate as one design team. And again, that's really difficult when we can't be in a room together. But one of the things we do is actually just play the game together. It's a lot easier now that we have um, uh, the private lobbies or limited private lobbies anyway, so the Fall Guys team can jump in and play together, which is fun. Can you just quickly explain the difference between a level designer and a feature designer in case anyone doesn't know? Absolutely. So a feature designer um, will uh, specify parts of the game that aren't the levels, which I know is kind of obvious to say, but that's things like the shop uh, and the menu and um, accessibility options and um, kind of the wider features. So things like squad shows, for example, which is something we've talked about that's coming up, um, but also the, the we have our special shows um, that we run um, every now and then, although it's the level team that will make those, it's the features team that put that feature together so that button in the menu that you can press to bring that up and then yeah the level designers are the ones actually creating the the games that you're running around and playing mm -hmm. and alex yeah i guess like echoing things similarly to ben um i think one of the things that you really take for granted when you're working in the office is just like the casual nature in which you can kind of look over the shoulder of your colleagues and be there to kind of interact with them and just like very quickly iterate backwards and forwards with on what you're working on. I think like since we are doing so much iteration and so much prototyping, we kind of took it for granted when you could just walk over to someone else's like machine hmm. and literally just test it right there. And then um, I think we've had to get a little bit better about kind of 
scheduling time for people to meet up and kind of do those things remotely. It's definitely been tricky, but I think we've improved a lot um, over the course of lockdown. And um, yeah, it's been difficult, but I just think like scheduling time, making sure there is time set aside to just socialize with your team properly and kind of maintain that healthy kind of relationship that you get in the office just by chatting and kind of just yeah playing and working together. How has it been for the two of you working for a company that has been around for such a long time but has become so well known so very suddenly? You've been has a little longer than me, Alex. Work, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think when I joined Mediatonic, it was around a hundred people, and it's definitely blown up a lot. Um, but it's been it's been fantastic to watch. Unfortunately, like it's kind of it's kind of hard to stay in touch with how it's all been because so many people have been hired whilst we've not even been in the office. Like mm -hmm. it's almost invisible to how us how much it's grown. Like obviously within the team, it's obvious like the chats have grown bigger and the, well, there's just more chats in general. There's a lot going on all the time. It's a little bit less like um, closed than it was before. But I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to pin down. I don't know about you, Ben. Yeah, it's difficult. I think. Well, I think that's the thing when. I started maybe it was a little bit bigger than 100 people but certainly the Fall Guys team is now bigger than Mediatonic was I think when I joined. And Mediatonic don't just make Fall Guys like we talked about um, there are Gears Pop and Yahtzee and Murder by Numbers and lots of different teams at the studio and you know Fall Guys isn't the only thing that's being worked on now but it's kind of invisible. We actually were due to move into a brand new office space much bigger uh, on the week of lockdown so we've never even seen it it's there waiting for us to go but we've not seen but maybe when we're there and sat at our desks one day we'll get yeah. a sense of how big the company <laughs> is now <laughs> yeah and you've got a new studio opening in Levington as well or opened yeah. already but obviously no physical space as of yet because that happened during lockdown as well yeah. um we've just we've got a comment from someone saying thank you really helpful and interesting talk I'm sure lots of people feel similarly um, let's see, what other questions have we got? Uh, this person asks, are there any levels from the spreadsheet that never made it into the game, but that you really loved? Oh, good question, because the, the answer to the first bit is yes, hundreds. Um, oh, now, <laughs> I'm trying to think my way back. There's, to some... there's, there's been some like, there's there's been ones at every kind of stage of the process, right? There's been like levels suggested that sound really cool as just a concept that never really made it to prototyping, but then there's also ones that made it to prototyping and then never got any further. Um, I don't know if you have any that you particularly remember from either of those categories, Ben. But I think there's one that I try. Maybe I can do it again now. I'm the lead level designer. There's one <laughs> I tried to get through for ages, which was basically pachinko but using the four guys so there's a version of it actually in our first trailer so you would drop down yourself and bounce off pegs and then try and land in a score bucket and for whatever reason never quite got through but it's been a while i might bring it up and pretend it's a new idea sorry if anyone from mt's listening is <laughs> brand new and i suggest it yeah is that a not enough skill too much chaos do you think i think so yes although what we have learned particularly well, not recently, but um, after we'd kind of finalised the character, is that there is quite a lot of air control. So um, when you are falling, you do have quite a lot of control about where you're going to go. And that's what allowed us to do rounds um, like ski fall, for example, where you can jump through the hoops. Um, and then also was kind of opened the door to having the fan obstacle, because at first we were like, well, it's just going to blow you up. What's the point? But actually you can move around quite a lot in the air, so it's OK. So I think we could revisit the pachinko idea because actually you've got quite a bit of control about where you're going to go so maybe maybe it is a bit more towards the skill than we thought at first. Awesome I'm interested in how your approach differs for the team rounds uh, because I don't think you really talked about those as much but presumably it's a slightly different design process than for the ones where everyone's just all out for themselves. It's different design process it's not too different at first actually what it tends to be is well, it's the same research process so we're you know stealing stuff from game shows or trying to invent new game shows or taking kids um playground games i think the thing for team games is that we'll, and this is something that we got a little bit better at doing but we tried to identify whether the round could work not as a team game um but sometimes there is stuff for example football which it has to be a team game it's just not going to work and the thing is that the interaction of hitting the ball into a goal is so fun um that we don't want to let that go so the, so that becomes a team game i think we we found um we started to do rounds like ski ball for example where it's solo solo score so um the player can you know crew score by themselves and then they kind of win like a race and i think that's unlocked the door now for a lot of rounds where 
we've been thinking of them as team games. They maybe don't need to be now, but there's always going to be team games because I know they are controversial, but they are also a lot of fun. And we're going to have um, squads modes on the horizon where people will be able to actually play and win as a team as well. So I think they're, they're going to see the golden light, I think, when when that mode is out for team games. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very exciting. Um, a general question here from one of the people watching. Where do you get inspiration from for new round ideas or gameplay? You've just said, you know, playground games, other game shows. Where else do you look for inspiration? Those are the main. What's the craziest place you think we've taken inspiration from, Alex? What's the Gosh. maddest thing? I don't. I, I don't. Yeah, I'm not even sure if I can say some of them, but like <laughs> Hexagon <laughs> specifically is kind of drawn from like, I guess, other games perhaps like i guess sometimes the ideas do kind of come from other games as well as like physical games in the real world often the ideas are coming from the seasonal theme mm. as well right like it might not be the case that it's something that already exists on tv or whatever but it lends itself to maybe a real world scenario that lines up really well with the actual season that we're delivering um in fact i guess um we have a new level coming up soon which we probably can't talk about but i think that one lends itself to kind of the season that it's made for really nicely and it focuses a lot on an yeah an object that is tied to the wintery theme <laughs> yeah just I, think we, I think we can i think we can leak snowballs and just say <laughs> that but yep. um <laughs> but i guess maybe that is a good example because um the the theme tends to come first so the art team will be figuring out what it's going to look like and and what the costumes and things are going to be and then that will lead us a lot i know usually you know the mantra is game design first but also it's really hard when there's a blank piece of paper so we kind of like it when someone goes it's going to be winter we can go okay that's much easier now to think of that i think the fan started off life as a blizzard didn't it and then we made it a bit more physical and turned it into a fan it's maybe a yep. weird one but <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this person here is asking about mid-season updates. So how does designing level variations, that is for mid-season updates, fit into the process? So I think from design's point of view, what we try to do in the mid-season updates is we'll have this whole new, we'll have two things. So we have a whole suite of new obstacles. Um, so now we can go back through all the old rounds and put them into those, which can come up with really fun results. Um, and then the other side is that we have new levels that don't have any variation. So we get to now put in all of the old obstacles into those ones. So it's kind of two parts of the same co coin. Um, and I think we tend to get our engineering and art involved there as well. There's The system is quite advanced. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, the art side of things is interesting because obviously we have all of these new obstacles, but they're all skinned to the new seasonal theme, um, which doesn't kind of mesh or look quite as cohesive with the old um, levels. So, for example, if we're adding a fan, there needs to be a corresponding version made for the kind of old themed version or the, the default themed version of Fall Guys that it kind of so that it fits nicely in there. Um, from the variation side of things, like season to season usually there's not too much work for engineering we've kind of <laughs> luckily done most of the hard work of already of kind of setting up everything that needs to happen for it to be something it can support um, and for the most part we can kind of leave it with the designers and they can kind of drop things in and use what we've made already um, to kind of implement bits um, sometimes we get requests for new kind of variation functionality that changes existing pieces of functionality and that's when we kind of get a bit more involved to kind of add that new functionality to add variation or spice to older levels that didn't have it before. I've got a question for engineering, Alex, oh. <laughs> uh, which is um, what are some of the common limitations that you come up against when you're moving the levels from just local to online? What are kind of your most annoying things that come up again and again, your worst uh, enemies? <laughs> I guess like networked object count is definitely our biggest limiting factor in making levels like we can make these awesome levels you can have these great ideas but if they just have too much networked content in them there's just no way we can deliver it to clients so we kind of talked a little bit about that earlier about how we can kind of combat those things but that's generally what ends up being the biggest um factor when making those levels or something that we need to consider roping in or kind of um yeah reeling back a little bit sometimes we'll make levels where we have like specific parts that are quite network heavy um, and then we kind of just have to dial it back a little bit or kind of consider what our options are or replace it with something that's not quite so network heavy um yeah and when you do do the um you know some objects local some objects online like you were talking about earlier have you know have people noticed have you seen players notice that i think the big one i, I guess we 
the big one is probably the door pieces in DoorDash. That's like the one that is obviously local. And I don't know if people have specifically noticed it. Um, <laughs> there are definitely gifts online of people like stood on the blocks and then getting pushed over the finish line by other people. And it's interesting because the other person probably doesn't see you stood on that block. The block is probably somewhere <laughs> else and you might just be floating, um, which isn't the best end user experience, but it's a trade off. You know, it's like sometimes that kind of lack of inaccuracy is worth it for mm the overheads that you'd have to pay otherwise. There's no way we could make DoorDash with all those pieces synced and the value that we'd get out of that isn't worth the costs of implementing it basically. Um, yeah, aside from that, the other big one that we implemented was a bunch of our more deterministically um, kind of uh, physics oriented objects like the hammers and stuff. We kind of fixed most of that from being like online driven to being driven by the server clock before release. So it was definitely something that people noticed mm. in the early days, maybe when we were doing the early betas. But when we actually came to release the game, uh, luckily nobody had to see that. So. <laughs> so a question for you, Ben, I think. So we talked about wall guys. That's the level behind me mm -hmm. there. Uh, when this level was added to the game, it proved a little bit controversial with players, so much so that it got its own Polygon article explaining why some players were finding it frustrating, uh, which mentions things like uh, the lack of an element of luck compared to other levels uh, and the dependence on the climbing mechanic, which hadn't been used quite as much beforehand. So what did you kind of learn from that level and what were the challenges with it that you will kind of bring forward when you're making other levels? I think the, one of the main things um, is the climbing mechanic. Uh, we never got it to feel as nice as we would want. So I think there are still things we could do that, to that level to make it better. But, um, you know, the ramps, for example, is one of the things that's in one of the other levels and we don't use them in, in that level so much. I think we might do now with the variation, actually. Um, I think one of the main things is that we try to have an alternate path in all of our race rounds. So in the gauntlets, for example, you know, there would tend to be something a bit skillful and then there will be a kind of slower path around the side and i think we were hoping of all guys that those would emerge just from the i guess the randomness of people pulling the blocks around it never quite does it to the way we were hoping um one thing we did do was that the walls do descend over time so it doesn't matter how horrendous people are at moving the blocks around you can eventually run over to the finish line <laughs> um i think though i think though wall guys is one of the tricky ones right because it is um very controversial and lots of people really don't like it and lots of people really love it and it scores mm -hmm. quite highly when we do our sentiment survey so it's one of those difficult ones where there are definitely lessons to learn from but it's also a lesson in not just listening to the people that really hate it that's the good thing about four guys is we have what 50 levels now so you can just <laughs> play another one <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I think I've got the final question from the audience here, but if anyone comes up with any other burning questions that they desperately want asked, type them in very quickly now. And if you get them in before Ben and Alex have finished answering this one, I might get to it. But this question is, were there ever any other title name ideas other than Fall Guys? And if so, what mm. were they? Um, wasn't it called Stumble Chums? I, I was about to say that. I feel, like that. I feel like that was floated around at some point, but I could never tell if it was a joke that came after Fall Guys, if it was actually a, a serious name, I'm not sure. We, um, I want to know when people started calling them beans and was that intentional? I have no idea when that happened, but I fully embrace it. I love it so much. <laughs> we, like, we call them beans now, I think. It must have been a community thing, I, I would assume. Oliver has been unbelievable. Like if there's anything like <laughs> super memorable like that that came from Fall Guys, it's almost certainly came from him. <laughs> Should get a partnership with Jelly Belly or something because I crave <laughs> jelly beans every time someone refers to them as such. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we haven't had any more questions come in, so I will thank you very much, Ben and Alex. That was incredibly informative, very entertaining. I'm sure everyone watching has learned a lot and enjoyed that thoroughly. Uh, we got a message from someone at Tonic Towers uh, from James. Just a message from Tonic Towers. A huge thank you to Play UK for the opportunity to meet you all. To everyone tuning in, it also says thank you to me for the expert hosting. <laughs> so I guess I have to read that out. Uh, but the team are super proud of you, Alex and Ben, which oh, is awesome. awesome. Uh, I will also thank the British Council uh, for organising this, uh, making it run so wonderfully smoothly. This has been a wonderful experience. Uh, and thank you all for watching and for asking your interesting questions as well. Uh, obviously, because this is an online event, we don't have the applause, but I'm sure everyone is silently, silently applauding at home. I'll do a little clap just for you into my microphone. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Ben and Alex.
Uh, the next talk uh, for Play UK is on the 10th of February. They didn't tell me to say this, but that is my birthday. So, you know, before you come along to the talk, just send me a tweet, say happy birthday, but do definitely come because it is Simon Barrett, who is the co-founder of Co-op Innovations. Uh, they recently released Space Team VR, which is very fun if you haven't played it. Uh, and Simon is going to talk about creating social virtual reality experiences. Obviously, we've learned from Fall Guys, uh, if you didn't know already, that social gaming is incredibly important right now. So uh, that is a talk not to miss. And that is the 10th of February. Maybe I'll see you there. Uh, until then, thank you so much for coming and uh, goodbye.